Thank you very much, Franz. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and thank you for inviting me back to Bielefeld again. I've actually been here now, I think, six times in the last nine years. Uh, I'm proud to say I've never been to Berlin, but I've been to <laughs> Bielefeld. That, huh? um, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's great, and I appreciate it. It's a very stimulating environment. Um, uh, so I, I can be heard. Everything's fine. I have this device, which I think I can manage. Um, so I'm uh, speaking um, on, on the theme of uh, standards of comparison. And this um, has developed very clearly from the project that you, will, many of you are, have undertaken. Um, and it continues as well from the talk I gave in the fall at the kickoff conference where, in which I tried to survey uh, from a ground level of really complete ignorance what kind of comparisons there might be in the Middle Ages in England, uh, because it wasn't a topic I had thought of um, before. Um, and so I have, for good or ill, kept operating at a pretty um, high level of, um, <laughs> not necessarily quality, but a high level of perspective, um, which means I'm skipping over lots, just picking things up where I could, looking really back through things I've read for many other purposes um, over the years, and trying then to, to see what comparison might amount to. Um, the one thing that I did in coming to prepare for today's talk to give a thematic order was I decided to try to look at areas which would contribute plausibly to the social or political and legal understanding, legal worlds. So that the question sort of was, if I look into those materials, what kind of comparison or quasi-comparative thinking or practices uh, would I find? Um, so that's basically what I did. And then I tried to make these different things uh, somehow cohere or see what I could see from them. And that's, of course, been um, difficult, but you can judge how that will be. So the outline um, you can see here, I will do some reading for sure. Um, not all of these uh, items will actually get discussed much. I think the big area that I'm confident that I'm going to drop uh, is actually the area more in political advice, political theory, so the intellectual history component. Um, time may require other cuts, but that's at least my, my, current, um, my current plan. All right, so um, I'll properly begin, and I want to see the clock. Okay, thank you. So my goals in this talk are probably three in number. First, to try to assess the degree to which practices of comparison were important in the more public life, of the English in the period from, say, 1100 through almost to 1600. A second, I want to try to understand something like the conditions that might allow cooperative comparative practices to flourish. If we know that explicit comparison is not a mode suited to all times and all tastes, it seems all the more interesting to wonder what allows comparison to emerge, and especially to gain some sort of entrenchment or even institutionalization. Third, I want to look across a long time period um, on the chance of finding some significant shifts in the place of the comparative within the public spheres of law and legislation. Overall, the hope is to see the weave of public and legal life with a special hope to touch elements that might plausibly have affected or been central to something like the national texture, the story of the strengthening kingdom. In reality, I will only be able to touch the fabric here and there. One crucial insight within the SF Bay is the emphasis on practices of comparing. The comparative is, therefore, always going to be part of something else, and the most potent comparing might be embedded in robust and reiterative practices. It is relatively easy to see that a comparative practice will be a sort of network inevitably combining social, semantic, and material life. Of course, because comparing is clearly frequently linguistic and almost inevitably cognitive, it can be hard to remember that as a practice or network, it will also exist alongside and because of objects and people and ideas that might themselves have no intrinsic connection to the comparative at all. The sort of relationship um, that comparing will have to materialities and social routines will be as important as the intrinsic comparative element to its flourishing. 
This might explain why some comparative practices, including some I'm probably going to mention, might not immediately feel as comparative as others. Why there is often doubt about what counts. Comparing is always but a part of a practice, and in some moments, the comparative will operate like a junior partner within a larger network of concern. It is also important to notice that comparing networks might also be fairly insular. In other words, they find their place as important, even expected in one actor network, but generally fail to make the leap to another. So comparing finds a place, as we'll see, in economic life more than in political life. Those leaps from one network to another are, however, one of the most important signs of comparing achieving、uh, a greater position in its world. Comparing in the public sphere is, of course, not easy to assess at any time, and, giving, and trying to decide if comparing is important in a particular place or time raises its own comparative challenges. Still, my point of departure is to try to ask how it might be that the practice of comparing might develop at all within the context of public life, especially national public life. Okay, so I'm going to mention、uh, some of these topics as we go through. I won't go through them now to take that time up.、Um, on the one hand, the long period through which I've sought materials was an was a period of extraordinary growth. And concentration of venues and forms of public life. England before 1066 and the arrival of the Normans was already the most centralized kingdom in Europe. But legal and administrative centralization accelerated very significantly during the reign of Henry II in 1154 to 1189. What I'd like to stress here is that areas of public life were created and stimulated that meant. That the content of practices within the legal and political system might have considerable reach, penetrating throughout the kingdom, to the widespread networks of the aristocracy and the Roman Catholic Church personnel. The 12th and 13th centuries added extensive royal administration, a significantly new、uh, system of law, and the courts and judges to give that system, which we can call the common law, near universal relevance in the kingdom. The 13th century added more powerfully again techniques for enlarging the variety of laws of the kingdom, and the creation of Parliament in the late 13th century would accelerate lawmaking as a somewhat representative and again universalizing move. The point here in our context is that to assess comparative practices within these structures is to find them where we can be sure that they would matter. The zone of public life was larger than institutions. Especially given the immense concentration of wealth and prestige in the hands of a relatively small number of people who were themselves incorporated into the new legal frameworks of law and parliament, comparative notions might well jump from public to private, and crucial individuals were always simultaneously both playing in complex social networks of power and presence. Okay, so this is taking me towards the first、uh, point on public performance.、Um, as we look for the areas of language where comparison emerges, it is useful to keep in mind that people might compare in one hand of life, but not necessarily in another. In fact, that's one of the big points about the whole thing: where does it work and where doesn't it? Here, I think, is, is an important medieval. Here, I think, is an important、um, medieval and Tudor icon. That was not an act of comparison. So, since I spent so much of my time actually looking at things that weren't acts of comparison, and now I'm kind of perversely showing you the ones in this talk that are sort of maybe acts of comparison,、um, I wanted at least to put something out here that I could see we might read, somebody might read comparatively, but I'm pretty sure that's not how they would read it. Um, and it is right is an object of prominent importance that was right around all the other things that I'm talking about. So it's it's King Arthur's Round Table, which you know is in Britain. They found it,、um, and they put it up on the wall in、um, uh, Winchester.、Um, at least it's now on the wall in Winchester, and it was painted at the end of the period I'm describing. So the knights are are named their places on the table as you go around it.、Um, you can easily see how you might. Do some comparing off of it, but I'm but I'm pretty sure they weren't doing any.、Um, how do I know that? Well, yeah, okay.、Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, so I start、um, uh, now at the kind of at the perimeter of the topic, and that the people I'm dealing with are about to show, and the objects that they dealt with are distinctly, I think, comparative. The people are very important, 
Um, but the acts are surely not what we would call law or policy making. I think they are kind of in the public realm, but not the other. But I wanted to bring this forward because I want to have that sense that there are comparative activities that were under uh, in play already. These cases are all going to be um, uh, 15th century, um, and they're involving people who were at the top of the political power of the country. Uh, so first. Um, is Henry Chichely, um, who you see here. This is a, a visual section, actually. Uh, the son of a peasant farmer, uh, a student of New College Oxford, canon lawyer, an ambassador, and eventually the Archbishop of Canterbury, and as such, a member of Parliament in the House of Lords. Um, second, um, one of my favorite guys, uh, Thomas Beckington, uh, he's the son of a village weaver uh, in late 15th century Somerset, also passing through New College Oxford on his way to a legal, administrative, and ambassadorial career. He became the king's principal secretary and keeper of the Privy Seal um, and the Bishop of Bath and Wells, and so also a member of the House of Lords. And last here um, is Alice Chaucer, uh, the granddaughter of the poet Geoffrey Chaucer and herself a key politician during the uh, opening phases uh, and middle phases of the Wars of the Roses. And a very Lancastrian rose she was too, till she became all Yorkie uh, later in her life. Uh, she became the Duchess of Suffolk, um, and though not a member of the House of Lords because she was a woman, uh, she was also... Um, one of the most ambitious and important political figures, and um, a rare female member of the Order of the Garter, which I won't talk about now, but maybe you've heard of it. Um, so these three people are crucial political figures, law shapers. Um, they were in these parliamentary sessions in many cases, or at least would be uh, closely involved. They all would have been deeply involved in law and litigation. So the part of the world that uh, the rest of the talk comes out of. Um, now, <laughs> uh, this is uh, Chichely again, um, and uh, looking not as good, maybe, I guess it depends. Um, <laughs> probably looking a little worse, uh, Beckington. And here is what we're actually looking at. Um, so this is the tomb of uh, Bishop Beckington, and you can see clearly uh, enough those two parts that we have. And so what I'm just claiming here <laughs> is that this is actually is a comparative structure, um, that these works are, that when they come to model themselves in death, the comparison is what's underway. And that this form of tomb, which is Becking, um, Chichely's is the first one in England uh, produced, and maybe the 12th, so far as we can tell, in Europe. Uh, but it's a, it's a thing people are doing in Europe, so there's a, a some turn towards a certain kind of comparative, comparative structure. Um, top and bottom, two different time segments, in effect, being depicted uh, in this case. Um, and the, can you see these well? It looks really good on my screen, but is it actually visible enough? So this is uh, the Duchess and... Uh, hers is particularly interesting um, because she, her body is in the middle. So, whereas the other one, you could see through it because he's buried elsewhere in front, she's actually in the cask in the middle between her two representations of herself. Right? So, um, I'm not quite sure how to work that all out um, in terms of the comparative elements, but there's more uh, in, in that one. Um, and then in the bottom, we have uh, this. Um, there's, I think, no more than four of these tomb styles with women, um, and I think there's all kinds of issues about them, and they're just fascinating. Um, so this is her from the foot end, and then uh, up close on her, on her, on her head. Okay. So, um, it's, it's not a strange thing in the side of the world, is the point. It's in the kind of highway of the, of the culture. These people are important. The two men's tombs were in cathedrals. England only has 17 bishops, right? So they are the most powerful, prominent people, and the churches that they're in are centerpieces of the entire kind of country. So there's a lot of traffic, in other words, that people would see about see them. 
um, and what they've chosen to do. Um, in the case of um, Chicheles, he actually says uh, on the tomb, um, born poor, later raised to bishop, now I'm cut down and served to worms, behold my grave. Okay, so the text gives us some history of it, but I think the tomb is comparing actually without the words. Right, so, you know, it's not an easy thing to say but for me, but I feel like that's going on. And once we go through the words, something else might be happening. Um, so one of the interesting challenges, of course, is how you manage the things that are a little less worded um, as we proceed. Mainly, I just avoid them or ignore them. Okay. Now, as I say, these are public prominent places. They can contribute then to some kind of um, networks of, of tomb styles and comparing, but they never become what I'm really interested in in this talk is a sort of a standard. There's not, they aren't a necessary item through which tomb planning works. Tomb planning is a necessary item, and comparison is a sort of an option, you know, a very expensive option, as you can probably guess, uh, to, work the, out this, to work out this scheme. Okay, so um, prominent people, a certain kind of comparative attitude aesthetically available to them and deployed by them, um, but not something that is necessarily going to become popular or dominant. It, it's a, you know, there's other tombs like these for the next hundred years in England for longer in other countries, but they're by no means a common, um, a common element. All right. So um, it's hard <laughs> now to switch to the second topic, to talk of the development of weights and measures with the same sense of curiosity of cadaver tombs of the rich and famous. Uh, but here I would make a bigger claim. Organizing comparative practices was a centerpiece of medieval kingdom making. And this mainly meant establishing regimes of comparing weights and measures via standards. Um, money, arithmetic, and measurement were central to developing states, and comparative practices were fundamental. Standard of comparison needs to be recognized as a fairly robust and precise idea. Measuring to a standard is not just a sort of comparative metaphor, but more like a whole reiterative network for comparison. The standard of comparison, as I mean it here, operates as a species of the tertium comparationis. Something is stipulated as a thing against which other things are compared. Its reusability and stability means that separate acts of measuring work transitively with all the comparata. A standard allows things to have a common denominator. It is not easy to achieve anything like a standard for comparison in social life, to create a network that, as it were, honors the standard and empowers it. But where successful, the creation of standards of comparison promises an ongoing, reproducible comparative process, linking a sort of stable network of ideas, implements, and occasions with that flow of arriving comparata. To be commensurable is to render the, com the comparable. So such is the, the logic. Uh, here is a bit of the history. Um, the core of English weights and measures <laughs> seems to derive from the pre-Norman Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. In the 10th century already, we have an edict of King Edgar, so the late 10th century, mid-late, um, on money and measures, um, and that it orders that there be only one sort of money and one sort of measured weight in the kingdom. What matters is that the distance and the weights become a standard, a pattern, and was fashioned into a real object kept in the treasury from which precise, pragmatic copies were made. What's more, uh, purpose-built standards were constructed as needed. So, for instance, in 1197, the size of woolen cloths, very important in England, was regulated to be two L's width. An L sort of derives from an elbow, sort of, maybe, it's sort of confusing. It's actually seems to be like it's two elbow lengths plus a bit. Um, <laughs> quite not far off a meter. Um, Okay, and the royal ordinance stressing this, and I quote it, that the L shall be, in the, be the same in the whole realm and of the same length, and the L shall be of iron. Okay, so something that might often happen with us is when we think of measures, we tend to have them quite abstracted. Right, so we kind of have a mathematical model with it. They, it's a thing, and, right, and they want copies of this thing located in all towns so they can check. And there's one kept in the, in the treasury in the Palace of Westminster that you can go and make sure that it's right. And money is, the, is kind of the same. Okay, so I skip a bit. 
Um, so there's a few documents from the uh, 13th century, as far as we can tell, um, used within the government. Uh, as you can see them kind of start organizing the world in this frame. And uh, one of them, at least, I will <laughs> let you enjoy. Um, so, uh, per or ordinance of the whole realm of England, the measure of the king is composed namely of a penny, which is called a sterling, round and without clipping. So that's the money, silver. Um, weighs 32 grains of wheat in the middle of the ear, of the wheat's ear, not by putting it into... <laughs> uh, and an ounce weighs 20 pence. And 12 ounces makes a pound of London. And 12 and a half pounds makes a stone of London. So you might know the British weigh themselves still in stones. And this is not the stone they use now, but it's... yeah. And eight pounds of wheat make a gallon. Pound contains 20 shillings. So th this is a kind of a strange document. There's a group of others like this on lengths, um, but it allows for these transitions within. And it's really the idea that you're going to have objects that then are associated with each other. Um, clearly here, proportion is a sort of comparative operation. But then there's that move from wheat to silver and from, very importantly, um, the pounds to the gallon. Right? So at that point, they turn uh, weight into into volume, right? which is an important part of some kind of logic that is, you know, some kind of logic that's operating. Um, and it doesn't matter because if you have the power, you insist on this, then all the items that come out conform to it, right? And they become the standard. It, you know, it really doesn't matter if these are silly or anything like that. Um, they actually think about them a lot in this period. I can't believe how much I've read about them, um, but I'm not going to inflict too much more about them on you. Um, however, a standard like that um, comes to then be imposed on a group of uh, laws that are the most important and in a way long-lived um, in English history. And these have to do, and I think I've talked about these before in Bielefeld, around um, ale and wine and bread. Um, so from around 1200, those commodities are cl closely regulated by uh, royal edict. And basically, that system stays in place from 1200 to 1830, okay, in which there's a kind of controlling of the, not just the price, because um, it's really not the price, it's the size of commodities offered for the price of money available. Right? So you always will have a penny loaf, a halfpenny loaf that you can buy, but the size of the loaf changes. And then the schedule of, of loaves connects to, there's a whole bunch of different loaves, and they're all kind of in a relationship with each other based on this pricing. It's <laughs> very complicated. I don't pretend to really understand how it works um, in detail, but in principle. But it's mandated then with, the, with this measuring. Okay. So we might say in all of these areas that these are just abstract uh, at one level, but what's really, I think, most important here is that they're actually, the interesting bit is not about the intellectual history of this document or the administrative history, it's actually in the practice zone. There are people who must then take the objects that have been weighed, measured against, you know, uh, the official object and check that everything is in conformity. And they do that, or people who have acquired that skill from them, that right, um, they do that uh, throughout the country. Okay, so it's a practical thing that somebody, a person, a group of people will be required to go to the market and validate these things on the king's behalf. Um, we know that they did this. Right? I've looked at hundreds of court records that have the lists of violations under all of these different assizes, under all these different rules. Uh, and this is what happens to you. This is a later one, um, but you would be put in uh, the pillory, uh, it's a common one if you were a baker who violated the rules. Um, the, the, the law actually has the rules for making the pillory because it was clear that bad things could happen. <laughs> you know, it was not meant to be capital punishment, so they sort of described some issues about how the pillory should be uh, constructed. Okay, taking too long with this. Oops, sorry. Okay, yes. Some of you may recognize this scene of weighing, but don't map the reality exactly onto the 
uh, because it's weighing against some other object. That one of those objects needs to be the standard. I guess the duck is the standard, actually, now that I think of it in that. Um, okay. So that I'll, I'll bring that to sort of end the, this next part. Um, and we'll move now to a different area. So I'm hoping that you might accept that on the money um, and weights and measures, we actually have a regime that is comparative, that's all over the place, um, but is sort of non-confrontational. It doesn't deal with people. Right, in an important way. The people part is mediated or secondary. Um, so more complicatedly, um, uh, we now turn to when you're thinking a bit about people. So in this section, I want to touch on another angle of comparison, I think, within the domain of public policy and lawmaking. Um, and it's something like discriminating among people. And although not probably in exactly the way uh, intended. This is from Monty Python, okay, for those who may not recognize it, it's not an actual medieval representation. Um, so in the com examples with the cadaver tombs, um, the comparison was personal, right? With somebody within themselves, it was virtually autobiographical. So social without being a matter of policy. This next section, though, we will see where some kinds of discrimination in policy with people uh, is coming to the fore. And this might be a little bit more uh, complex to work through. Um, I should uh, maybe then just say very quickly, I mentioned that um, a parliament in the first moments, um, the laws that I've described so far are ones that um, simply emerged from uh, royal edicts before there was, presumably in discussion with council people, like those bishops maybe. Um, but from now on, everything else I think I'm going to touch on uh, will involve, uh, at least in the, on the statutory side, well, statutes, laws made with parliament. And that changes very much the dynamic of lawmaking um, in the country. Um, there's a lot more of it. Um, uh, maybe the only thing that um, needs to be said for sure is that the composition of parliament are those bishops, the great lords of the land, and there's not a hundred of them in England. So this is with the bishops, and that there's like a hundred in the lords. They own 90% of the stuff. Okay, so there's that. Then um, there is the lower house, the House of Commons. That's the new thing. So when Parliament is created at the end of the 13th century, as I'll put it for now, that's the new thing. Um, and that means that they include um, two knights from every county are chosen by the county and then citizens, burgesses, from 70 to 100 or so different um, towns. This is where uh, Parliament met as, met as a whole in the old House Palace of Westminster, which uh, burned in the 19th century, the Painted Chamber. This is where the House of Commons met. Okay. Um, so what would happen very often in the side of legislation, in the area that I'm moving to right now, is that the Commons um, usually would ring, ring requests to the government. So when the House of Commons comes, they would ask the king for something. He would ask them for things too, like tax. Uh, but they would ask for various things. And in the 1360s, 70s, we, have, we seem to have an interesting moment. This follows the Black Death. Um, so there's a lot of social pressure, let's say, economic pressures as well. And um, a petition comes in uh, for, from the House of Commons, from some groups in them, for law that will control consumption. So this is a sumptuary legislation. There's you know, some of them in most countries in Europe. Um, I'll read just a bit of this piece of it. Um, the prices, it's connected to price rises. Prices of various vittles within the realm are greatly increased because various people of various conditions wear various apparel not appropriate to their estate. Um, and then, as they later say, various things, poor and other women wear the dresses of ladies, poor clerks wear clothes like those of the king, and so on. So there's something going on then that allows us to see a variety of people uh, in, the, in the country and legislation that's coming in of that sort. And this was not normal, u usual in the period, actually, at all. And it's sort of uh, maybe uh, interesting. There's often special interest laws, but not where everybody is kind of looked at. So um, what follows then from the petition is legislation. Um, it's fairly extensive and it's a bit peculiar 
uh, for the country um, in, in these terms. So uh, you do get just the accounts of what people can wear. So this is from the second lowest tier of the list. I think there's seven ranks that are discriminated um, here. That craftsmen and people called yeomen shall not take or wear cloth for their clothing or shoes of a higher price than 40 shillings for the whole cloth by way of purchase or otherwise, nor precious stones, cloth of silk or silver or a belt, knife, brooch, ring, garter, etc. Um, and that their wives, daughters and children shall be of the same condition in their clothing and apparel. And that they shall not wear any veil of silk, but only of yarn made within the realm and or any manner of fur, except only that of lamb, rabbit, cat and fox. Okay, so then you can imagine when you go up the other length, you get fancier stuff. Um, but it's keyed to social groups, right? So there's a money keying, a social group keying, and then the stuff itself. Um, and now, I'm, not, I'm never sure what, whether to call that in and of itself comparative. You know, and I go back to the wheel, um, uh, King Arthur's table, looks this time like it might be. However, um, there's something going on here, though, that makes it clearer um, that they're thinking this way as well. Um, okay, so in another section, it says, merchants, citizens, and burgesses, artisans, and craftsmen, who clearly have goods and chattels to the value of 500 pounds, um, may take and wear in the same manner as the esquires and gentlemen who have land and rent to the value of 100 pounds a year. So, it breaks into this parallel model in which s s urban, urban groups and rural groups are, uh, are, are made equivalent in this way through these ranks that are moving up. So clearly somebody has had to be thinking administratively of this process. It has, it's hugely interesting for the whole question of the social status of that world, but, but something else has clearly crept in. Um, you could see it growing uh, as, a, as a way forward. Okay, so that's one of these laws that has this char character. Um, and there are others, though, and the one that I want to speak to now um, uh, comes up in the late 1370s, and this is taxation. Um, and again, coming from the uh, House of Commons, oops, um, <laughs> not the Navy Act, coming from the House of Commons uh, is a request for kind of a new taxation system uh, under the midst of some pressure from, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, and what they come up with is a model in which the taxes are graded, graduated by the same kind of statuses. Uh, it starts out very personally. Um, it'll say that the Duke of some two Dukes are named personally. You know, they're each going to pay 40 pounds tax. Uh, then it comes down to um, classes, and sorry, I'm trying to yeah, to particular classes, and then we get a similar parallel. So it says, um, you know, the Duke of Lancaster and the Duke of Brittany each paid ten marks. Sorry, not forty pounds. Uh, and then a graduated scale with equivalences for widows. So also every widowed countess of England pays as much as earls, four pounds. Um, and then they break into though, to this urban split again. So the mayor of London is to pay as much as an earl, four pounds, and so on as they work through it. So the, you, know, you can see a kind of a thinking that seems to be that's showing that there's some traction has been achieved for a certain kind of comparative thinking that's connected, though, to the distinguishing among the people. Right? So th there's not a necessary connection between those things. They come together in these moments as an administrative good idea. Politics seems good for it. They're very wrong about that. Um, and then they launch this system. Right? Um, after this, we hardly see this kind of uh, gradation produced. So what happens is, in 1381, there's a peasant rebellion, um, so the only really big rebellion that England suffers until, no, arguably the 17th century, um, and, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing, for sure. And in the aftermath of that, there was a lot of rethinking uh, of the general political and social situation. So I'm, I'm not sure how to make the connection exactly, but, but this sort of gradation does not develop. Okay, so I'm going to throw in one bit of a connection. 
um, from a piece that I cut supposedly from this talk, uh, but I talked about in, this, in the fall. Uh, the literature showing up in a few decades after, uh, some of that says comparison is, that's where the comparison is odious idea comes from. Right? And we t I talked about that in the fall, and that idea in, in a couple of different works shows up. What do they mean? Well, I think now that if actually there's a sort of resentment that builds up through those sorts of constructions and that they don't want to do things that will ignite it um, or irritate people through it. And so the withdrawal from that kind of method um, becomes just part of what they've decided bureaucratically. Um, you know, the, the tax system is, is a, you know, it goes back to the old form afterwards. Um, so anyway, and kind of an example then of how it is that um, uh, you, you could see something that might grow into a larger scheme, graduated income tax that we have. You know, that sounds fine to us, right? That, doesn't, you know, that sounds like a good thing. Progressive income tax sounds good. Um, but here, there's a, everything else, you know, it, it all unravels. So it kind of just depends what you're in association with as you're, as you're proceeding. So um, what I uh, want to do next is to skip ahead a lot, uh, having looked at these few bits and pieces, and try to see whether in um, the 16th century there were, um, we could see some changes showing up in any form. So to see whether the kind of light comparison, failed comparison regime, or a comparison for objects <laughs> regime that the medieval had uh, was going through some kind of uh, transition. Um, and so looking, you know, there's a, a huge amount of legislation um, in the Tudor period. Um, Henry VIII is very, uh, is a lover of parliaments and of legislation. Um, uh, and what I would say after <laughs> reading lots of these things is there's a few things, mainly there's nothing about comparison, but there's a few things that do certainly show up. One is a temporal kind of comparison. So this is more on the side, I'd say, of the rhetorical and the political, but it seems quite important. Um, the earlier laws tended in the preamble to say things are bad, people are dressing badly, they shouldn't do that, we want them to do it this way. They now will increasingly say, things have gone downhill. Okay, so the language turns into one in which there's decay, there was a better time, there's decay, and there now should be reform. Right, so, and reform is the word that they use frequently. So the Reformation age, that's the word they're using. So there's a sort of way in which they're imagining, without any data for sure, um, the kind of uh, chronological uh, story that's there, and that the legislation comes in as a solution to. So uh, clearly that to me seems, you know, it's important, um, but it's not connected to anything that we might call statistical or something like that. We, we, they're, they're almost never trying to prove it. They simply um, assert that that's the case. Um, so th there's that that's happening. Uh, there are sometimes, um, and you can see that here, um, the Navy Act, um, the same Navy and multitude of ships is now of late marvelously um, impaired and decayed, and by occasion thereof, not only a great multitude, so, People lose their jobs as a consequence of it. There's a, the numbers of different kinds of legislation will have this kind of rhetoric around them. Um, uh, the one that I particularly um, uh, would like to notice, of course, um, is one involving horses. Um, there's a lot of legislation, in fact, in horses. Um, and as some of you may know, I'm interested in horses. And so they're worried that horses are getting smaller. They are decayed and diminished um, by reason that because they're let to wander in common lands and then the horrible thing, the little stoned horses, so that is uh, male horses that have their stones, uh, are causing the problem. So this documents actually are connected to race, people who've been interested in trying to uh, tracks and kind of racialized theories have been interested in the legislation on these horses. Um, so we, we see that, the decay narrative. But what's kind of interesting to me is that we also see that they, um, uh, to solve it, they bring forward the idea, one, of measurement. Right? So they deploy in the legislation um, a threshold 
of size for the horses. And they're able to do that because they've already established you know, a, a, the model that you might take any problem and try to put a measure on it. Um, it's objective in that way. And they um, bring on um, the idea that, this is a bit, uh, the hand. So I don't know if this has any resonance or not in Germany, but it's still the case in Canada, the United States, Britain, and all that horses are measured in hands. And so that, and this seems like the first formalization of a completely national standard for the hand, uh, which they measure horses in. Uh, I was surprised to find that maybe not everyone <laughs> so obvious. <laughs> How can you not be measuring horses and hands? Um, so the measurement scheme comes in, there's the temporalization that's at play, um, and the legislation then kind of ensues. So the idea in this small case is that you're able to see the way that different kinds of uh, issues clip together. Um, so that there's you know, the idea around horses, but then you have the rationales that you might use. Those might one day get a mathematical solution to them if you get more statistics. But without that, there may still may be another method, which is that you can do a, a measure, because we're used to doing measures. So that becomes a kind of portable element that moves in, connects to a different situation, brings in a different kind of comparison with it and a comparative technique, and so practice. It's not just theorizing about it, it's horrible if horses are small, um, which there's books about also. Um, and then you can kind of see that in becoming a kind of mode of legislation that is acceptable. Um, whether it's successful or not becomes, becomes a, different, uh, a different thing. Okay. Um, so a whole area that I'm not going to talk about, really, um, uh, is involving uh, bringing these terms to the kind of ethnographic side. Um, so I read through all the laws about aliens, uh, through the Middle Ages and after, the laws about Jews, the laws here about strangers, and aliens are the same thing. Um, the laws about the Roma who show up in the 16th century, so there's this concern, two different pieces of legislation about uh, the arrival of them. And by and large, <laughs> those do not show uh, the comparison that we think. And that probably is of interest uh, to people who've worked on ethnographic discussions in other moments. There are other ethnographic kind of materials where comparison works. I talked about some um, in the fall. But in the legislative context, they're not usually thinking that. However, this one um, is, is a kind of more interesting moment. You can see the temporalization, the decay of the realm. Uh, the other time you see with aliens is with merchants and fair treatment. So there's certainly an issue that our merchants should be treated like their merchants are treated by us. All right, so the, but that itself, with, uh, without that, you don't actually see the, the comparative element come forward as much um, in, these, in this sort of legislation. Um, but I don't have time to uh, give it any details. Um, so the last thing I want to um, uh, talk about um, is um, uh, the courts. So much of what I'm saying so far has been about this sort of legislative work through Parliament, um, and that's kind of one form of life or one way. Uh, but there was something else going on in this period in the common law that is uh, really hard to understand, absolutely fascinating, um, and that is uh, how the law gets made in the courts by the judges and lawyers. And um, you may know that um, you know, English law is anchored, so we say, on precedent. Um, and uh, so to try to find out the development of precedent is part of what this is connected to, on the idea uh, that precedent is a sort of comparison. Okay, now, <laughs> I can see people having lots of views about that, I've had many myself, um, but that at some moment, and maybe lots of other legal things are also, you have a statute and you're somehow conforming, you're taking one thing to it and trying to see how it fits. So there's another logic around this of, of genus and species that maybe is a better way or in, not sure. But there's something in this way that precedent develops today um, where it's not so hard to see it as a comparative practice. Right? It's, hard to, it's harder to make it make sense when you think of it only as a kind of reading and writing practice. But if you're actually thinking about them trying to work out uh, legal actions based on it, it's a bit easier in that frame of of place and procedures to see it. 
So the, the basic idea is that at some moment, you're going to have to decide when you have a case in front of you, a legal case, whether or not it is an instance of this earlier one. Right? And so in thinking about that, is that a comparative process? Okay. As I said, one could go one or the other. It's pretty close um, to it. Um, and unlike just a process that might be a literary or philosophical or academic one, these are ones that, obscure as they are, are going to matter. Um, and they're almost particularly wonderful in the common law because it's, oh, it's very hard to understand any of it. But once they decide it, it's the law. <laughs> so even if it doesn't make sense, it just that's what happens. Um, and that issue is the one that I thought, okay, we can see this in development. Um, so this uh, is the, an image of the court of common pleas. I believe I showed a different court in the fall, um, where most of the, the kind of heavy intellectual lifting was taking place. Um, and uh, to make this long story short, it, it, before 1400, it doesn't look like actually they had the idea of precedent we do at all. Um, that their idea more was that they had a reasoned conversation um, uh, of those who were the lawyers and the judges, and they found out by thinking what happened in the past, but also just by principles of reason, uh, what it was that the law is, right? how they would find that law and interpret it. But they didn't very often actually try to get specific about <laughs> what, the, uh, what anchored it. Okay? So they had a lot of different moves. And I think the, the short answer for why is that it was incredibly oral, so the whole procedure that they were operating under. Um, so the ability to answer these questions is um, uh, uh, generated because there are 25,000 cases with direct speech, supposedly, dialogue um, that we have, most of those published, printed, and searchable, um, called the yearbooks. And those run from the late 13th century uh, to the first part of the 16th century, depending on how you, how you understand them. So you can read in these conversations now, not the treatises on law, which don't talk about these things very much, but actually then what the judges are sometimes saying. So you can sort of see how they care about precedent, what's happened in the past, but they also don't feel like, sometimes they'll have a, a, you know, a bon mot that you can't, you, you, you shouldn't follow things just because they're examples. And so they're, they're, that's not their kind of procedure you know, to go forward. So this looks like, you know, <laughs> when does this end be, stop becoming a dead one? Um, uh, you know, it works at some level just as a regular interpretive framework, but it works particularly, well, after 1400, uh, there's an increasing amount of um, what we would call um, strong precedent thinking, which is uh, to the order of, and I have quotations I won't go through, but um, because I know that somebody has said this before, I won't, I can't overturn it. Right? So that notion, which is the strong model that um, is used in Anglo uh, law, you see some of the judges do that. And it's connected with another turn, which I think is important here, and again, in a kind of actor network form, which is that they increasingly use books. So they had a lot of books. These yearbooks are books that they produced but they increasingly, in the dynamic of the courtroom, will say, somebody needs to go look at that. I have a book at home to look at. We'll go look at the book tomorrow. So the book statuses are quite odd because they're not, you know, it's not the Torah. It's just some notebooks that they all kind of have and share. But still, it's starting to have some idea that they will connect their decisions to that. Once you do that, it becomes easier to start pointing with a kind of precision that makes that tighter comparative move uh, possible. Okay. So that's something that seems to start at 1400 and to kind of finish, that has come to a fruition around 1600, so really taking me to the end and beyond of my uh, time in more uh, senses than one. Um, so maybe I'll just try to pull a few things together and maybe then you can ask me questions. Um, in looking for different networks of comparison, in later medieval English public life, we can see stronger or weaker forms in the public artistic life of aristocratic death, in the mundane but consistent work of weighing and measuring, counting and assessing. Where stable standards of comparison were achieved, it was possible to replicate models. This is, of course, hard to do where contestation is strong, and this is probably why standards are easiest to achieve where they are neutral or once uh, they are neutral. 
Then they can be used to adjudicate other problems, like taxation or the value of monasteries or the best way to improve horses. The common law reasoning is a good case to show that certain intense contexts of education and power can take advantage of material changes in technology to push old ideas towards new practices. In any case, developing comparative practices will only work to the extent that they can be networked effectively with the material, social, and ideological elements. They are inevitably present, but often pulling in directions comparison might not be able to go. Comparison existed with some prestige in medieval England, but it was usually in a tenuous position. If the sense that comparison within human affairs was dangerous and pernicious was strong, it was perhaps being countered by the idea that temporal comparison was potent. Increasingly in the late Middle Ages, in public life, the idea that things were in decline but could be better brought a new form of comparison to the fore. It seems progress beckoned. Thank you for your patience.